August 1755. The first baptism took place at the Dutch Reformed Church in the Gaul Fort. And since then, hymns are heard from the church premises. 100 years before this church was built, and centuries later, this 96 acres of land has witnessed a number of unforgettable moments. Invasions, battles, celebrations, ballroom dancers and music were all part of it. On the orders of Goa's Portuguese Viceroy, Francisco de Almeida, his son was trailing an Arab ship in the Indian Ocean when he discovered Gaul. Lorenzo de Almeida's fleet was redirected by the ocean winds and sailed to the Gaul harbour on the 5th of November 1505. Legend has it that one morning it was the sound of a cock crowing that made him realize that there was land nearby. A cock is known as Galo by the Portuguese and it was after this incident that the Portuguese municipal arms Cock on the Rock came into being. It was the Portuguese that led the ambitious Dutch to the Gaul Fort and that is how they discovered the prosperous isle of Sri Lanka. When the Dutch arrived, little did they know that the Portuguese had been ruling the country for over 50 years, primarily for the island's fertile soil, which even back then was something worth fighting for. On the 13th of March 1640, the Dutch East India Company of VOC arrived at the Gulf Fort after defeating the Portuguese. They used their most advanced technology and strengthened the fort impeccably. On the 23rd of February 1796, the era of the Portuguese ended at the Gulf Fort. Native kings as well as the British tried to capture this significant place but as they failed, the captain of the 70th Regiment, Lachlan Makari, took over the fort without much resistance. In 1948, when Sri Lanka attained independence, the Gaul invasions came to an end and in 1988, UNESCO declared this live monument a World Heritage Site. Sri Lanka played a pivotal role during medieval times. It became a meeting and exchange point, especially for merchants from countries like Arabia, China, Morocco, um, the Netherlands, Britain and even South India. When the Portuguese arrived in 1505, they too became part of Sri Lanka's history. Despite the Dutch and the British invasions, their ways of life was also inculcated in the communities that exist even to this day. In 1988, UNESCO listed this thriving city, the Gaul Fort, a World Heritage Site mainly because of its historical significance. Let me show you why this place continues to attract thousands of people from across the globe. The naturally formed harbour in Gaul was what initially caught the eyes of the Portuguese. Apart from this, Superior quality products such as cinnamon, 
pepper, gems and ivory were shipped from the island when the northern monsoon winds did not prevail. The Portuguese felt the need to protect Gaul from the land side. They decided to build a large promontory and three bastions. The Dutch called these the Sun, Moon and Star Bastions at the time of reconstruction after the war. I'm walking into the Sun Bastion, which was once one of the main defence lines on the land side. This was initially named after the Roman Catholic saint, St. James, and the Portuguese built this so that they could protect themselves from any native attacks. The Portuguese, who were masters of the sea, paid more attention to the land than the seaside. This is because Sitavaka Maya Dunna and Sitavaka Raja Singha were Sri Lanka's brave kings that would instigate sporadic attacks from this end. The construction of the St. James Bastion was completed in 1620. In 1640, when the Dutch landed in Sri Lanka to the east of the fort, they understood that this bastion was a strong point, which led to Admiral Willem Jacob Costa capturing it. Let's take a closer look at the bastions which were built during the Dutch rule. St. James Bastion, built in 1667, was reconstructed by the Dutch and named as Sun Bastion by Hester de Solem, the future wife of the governor at that time. Cannons were placed at the bottom of this bastion, which faced the northwest and the top levels of the eastern side. The Dutch had a strong hold of the Gaul fort, making it difficult for anyone, including the native forces, to capture it. Its rulers changed only when they handed it over to the British East India Company in 1795. This goes to show that the fort was built extremely well. Although these high stone walls were constant targets, there was no way in which outsiders could have got through as the city was thoroughly protected. The walls would stretch up to 100 feet while the strongest wall, which was part of the Moon Bastion, was 400 feet in length. The Moon Bastion, also known as Middle Pont by the Dutch, is where the clock tower is and is also known to be the strongest bastion on the land side. Apparently during the war with the Portuguese, this was severely damaged, but by 1760, the Dutch managed to hoist 19 cannons below here and above along the walls. The Moon Bastion is a feature that cannot be replaced in the Gaul Fort. The clock tower that can be seen today in Gaul was erected in memory of Dr. P. D. Anthony's, who was once the chairman of the Gaul Municipal Council and pioneered a protest against the demolition of the Gaul Fort ramparts in 1889. The Moon Bastion was known to the Portuguese as Conceição, which means Immaculate Conception. The Dutch, on the other hand, chose more practical names. The Moon Bastion was renamed and was opened also by Hester de Solem and Governor Rickloff van Goens. There are 19 cannons that can be seen. From here, you could not only see the movements in Gaul, but also movements of the Sun and Star Bastion, which is on either side. This is why cannons were placed in front from one corner to the other. The Moon Bastion, also known as Dekat, 
was complete in 1667. There were five cannons stationed on this bastion. Therefore, 109 cannons in total were being operated at that time with the use of 19 soldiers. The total number of soldiers in the surrounding area was 263. Just like the moon bastion secured the land side, the star bastion to my right secured both land as well as sea. These were definitely high security points during the Portuguese, Dutch and even the British rule. I'm standing on the biggest gunpowder magazine at Gold Fort, the Star Bastion, also known as St. Anthony's by the Portuguese. There's a massive underground tunnel that goes all the way to the Sun Bastion that the soldiers must have used. At one point in time, there were six cannons which were mounted along this area. We are 19 feet above sea level. It is here that one can find the largest powder magazine in the fort. There is an underpass built to walk through. The materials that were used to build it ensure that it is free from exploding. Protecting both land and sea is the Star Bastion. It was the wife of Commander Adrian Ruthas who named the Star Bastion in 1667, while his daughter fired the first cannon to mark the occasion. The cool sea breeze which flows through this area today was used as a battleground during the British rule. The final battle was in 1810 between two men of the British Army, Parker and Brown. Brown was defeated. The Portuguese built the Sun, Moon and Star Bastions along with the Black Fort that I'm going to show you next. But the Dutch are the ones that strengthened these bastions and as the numbers of wars increased, built bastions right along the Gulf Fort. Thanks to them, the British had very little to do and we get to walk along these bastions and take a look at what actually happened back in the 16th century. In the Gulf Fort, the Black Fort was indeed a significant creation by the Portuguese. This bastion, known as the Fortaleza by the Portuguese, was used to attack those who came from sea. Situated 3.5 meters above sea level, this area is connected to the top floor through a tunnel. Judging by the technology that was used back then, this area was rather skillfully built. Well, the Portuguese call this the Fortaleza, the Dutch call it a black fort. This is because during the Portuguese period, there was a high demand for weapons and they made their weapons right here. The charcoal smoke would get onto the walls, giving it a black texture and hence the black fort. This bastion was built during the time of Captain Constantine the Tsar. His cold-blooded ways saw his death on the 25th of August, 1630, during the Randenigala battle in Kandy. It was King Raja Singha, known as Maha Astana, that won this battle and became ruler of Kandy. Although 
Constantine the Tsar died, his bastions live on. Known as the Black Fort, this was renovated by the Dutch. The Black Fort prison cells can be seen even to this day, thanks to the conservation efforts by the Central Cultural Fund. The Portuguese were fearful of the native king, but the Dutch had to be concerned about invasions from both land as well as sea. This is why they built stronger ramparts out of granite and earth, more bastions as well as higher walls, maybe reaching 50 to 70 feet. In 2009, the Central Cultural Fund uncovered some of these bastions. Now, these bastions are important because they're the closest to the lighthouse and it faces the Gaul Harbour. The Dutch remained safe with their tall walls and cannons. When the English took over from the Dutch, they focused their attention on protecting not just the land and sea, but the sky as well. Their four cannons would be placed not only on the land side, but facing the seaside as well. The Central Cultural Fund's conservation efforts on the cannon mounts are visible today. Named after the Greek god Triton, this bastion has a foundation in which the cannon can be mounted on. Judging by the steel tracks, the cannon could have moved back and forth and from the right to the left and vice versa in a semicircle. Covering a vast area of the sea, these cannons are extremely powerful on the battleground and can easily prevent intruders from entering. The main entrance, which was built in 1609, today carries the royal arms of Great Britain. This doorway, located near the warehouse, was a busy area back then. The 70th Regiment of the British Army entered through here in 1796. They marched through the entrance across Queen Street to remove the defeated Dutch army that could have been found in the premises at that time. When the British took over, the Dutch coat of arms was removed and placed on the inner side of the tunnel entrance. This massive elongated building would connect the Sun Bastion and the Black Fort. The warehouse served a dual purpose for the Dutch as it not only stored their merchandise, but also as a second rampart. This was the heart of the VOC. Luxury items such as cinnamon and pepper were sent out to the world from here. The Gulf Fort also served as a dockyard. Today this building is a landmark for Sri Lankans. Clad in traditional Sinhalese wedding attire, these couples identify this historical place worthy enough to take photographs to remember the day they start their lives together. These moments portray the Gaul Fort in a different light. A sight that even tourists appreciate. Opposite the commander's house, you can find the Maritime Archaeology Museum, which was once the Dutch warehouse. Now, in here, you'll find various artifacts that belong to the maritime ancient trade and sea life. And some of them were actually uncovered during excavations by the Central Cultural Fund's Maritime Archaeology Unit. Now, formerly, at the bottom floor of this building, it held Dutch provisions, while on top, you can find Indian cloth and Silanese cinnamon because of its dry and safe environment. 
The Maritime Archaeology Museum was established in 2010 on the 4th of March. The museum contains various information and artifacts that belong to the colonial period as well as previous civilizations. Visitors of all sorts, including researchers, are able to obtain a great deal of information related to the fort and its ties with the rest of the world. In 1659, the Avonster, or the Evening Star, was a ship that sunk close to the Gaul Harbour. The artifacts that were found at the wreck through a number of maritime excavations can be seen at the museum. During another excavation, the Dutch bell at the site of the Hercules shipwreck is a favourite in the museum. A carving on top of this bell says, Love will conquer all and is dated 1625. All discoveries of the Maritime Archaeology Unit can be found here at the museum. The ancient Gaul harbour and the number of shipwrecks that surround it is a sign of hope for scientists. Through the Maritime Archaeology Unit, the Central Cultural Fund hopes to accommodate tourists to the bottom of the ocean to observe these wrecks firsthand. This would be a rare adventure for both local and international tourists. Touring the Gulf Fort is a unique experience. The city is full of activity at any time of day. A novel feature of the fort that should be mentioned is the colonial architecture found at almost every corner of this ancient city. The city bleeds of Dutch architecture. You can find fragments of it everywhere. Some of the best can be found at the Dutch church and the Maritime Museum. The most remarkable part is that the buildings that came after also adopted this kind of architecture, especially the Buddhist temple. Take a look at the roads, the brick roads and even the lampposts are all phenomenal features. One of its best examples of architecture is the marvellously designed Dutch Reformed Church. Its foundation is in the shape of a cross and therefore it was called Cruz Kirk or Cruciform Church. Its big wooden doors and vivid stained glass windows illuminates the church. On the occasion of his wife giving birth to his daughter, Casparis de Jong constructed this church in 1752 as a symbol of gratitude. The church and its 18th century organ are conserved by the Central Cultural Fund. There are tombstones placed inside as well as the outside of the church. While the most privileged have their tombstones inside, the last burial that took place was in 1863. The Anglican Church was consecrated during the British regime in 1871. James G. Smither, one of the most finest architects in the 19th century, was responsible for this building's beautiful design. The Buddhist temple at the fort also has a hint of Dutch influence that can be seen through its architecture. This temple was built in 1889, where the Portuguese church once was. It was destroyed during the Dutch rule. It is worthwhile to pay attention to the details of the Sudarmalaya Viharaya. The Mira Mosque is a pearly white edifice. When the Portuguese arrived in 1505, it said that the Muslim traders would fear them. 
In the Portuguese times, no mosque or even Muslims were allowed to live within the fort walls. The mosque was completed in 1909. There are over 400 buildings in the Gaul fort and among them are three churches, a temple and a mosque which is just a few feet from each other. These are only symbols of coexistence that prevail within the fort. But if you take a closer look, you will also find people of various cultures and religions living harmoniously in the fortress. Residents of the Gulf Fort still live in Dutch-inspired homes. These can be identified by the spacious verandas known by the Sinhalese as Istopwa, a word derived from the Dutch as Stop. The old homes in the fort were built around the 18th century. In 1745, the Dutch banned the use of kajang or dried woven coconut leaves for roofs as it was inflammable. The roofs were rebuilt with roofing tiles that were introduced by the Portuguese. Over the years, these houses may have been renovated, but most with Dutch architectural features such as thick colossal pillars are still identifiable. They were built to meet the tropical climate of Sri Lanka. Other interesting features, such as ancient water wells, can also be found. This UNESCO World Heritage Site brings in numerous visitors from across the world for its star quality hotels, cozy restaurants, dynamic art galleries and shops. These two have maintained the theme of the Gulf Fort. There are souvenirs and gifts for everyone to take home. Yet another glorious sundown. The lighthouse prepares for it first. At a distance, it is seen soaring from the Utrecht bastion. The lighthouse faithfully looks over the city and its sea. Everyone, including foreigners, gather along the ramparts and the bastions on the lighthouse end in the evening. The Gaul Harbour and its natural formation, Sri Lanka's position in the Indian Ocean and the variety of luxurious spices the country has in abundance are just a few reasons why Sri Lanka became so popular in the ancient world. Today we can still see local and foreign nationals flooding this very place. The fort's very own history and atmosphere is unlike any other monument in the world and this is what brings everyone together. The sun sets like art on a canvas. While an artist portrays it with his paintbrush, the sounds of the sea connects the epic tales of the Gulf Fort. I'm beside the Neptune Bastion, named after the Greek god, and they say that there was a windmill placed here which sprayed water and made the environment cool. When we toured this ancient living city, I hope you understood why UNESCO wanted to name it a World Heritage Site. And I hope I've given you a good enough reason to visit Sri Lanka and experience this city's unique beauty.